Amen. Thanks for that. We're in Psalm 29. It's a short psalm, so I'm going to go ahead and read the whole psalm, and then we'll look at it together verse by verse. Psalm 29, a psalm of David. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forests. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Amen. So we have this storm psalm that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the old church historians say that they would sing this in a storm. And it, it just reminds the power of God found in nature, a nature psalm. We have psalms about the heavens. We have psalms about the sun, the moon, and the sky. And here we have the psalm of a storm and the power and the greatness of God as seen in his creation. Uh, we have storms come through every once in a while out to our place, just like I'm sure you do in yours. Here in Maine, we get nor'easters. You get thunderstorms sometimes. They can move in pretty fast and they can get pretty loud and things can shake and you can see lightning and the dog whines and the little one wants to hold on to mama because of the power in the storm. This is Hebrew poetry, and we have here the use of this term, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, and give God credit for the power of nature. And when I say nature, I'm speaking of God's creation and the natural world that we can see and hear and taste and touch with our senses. It's connected to the physical. God's connected to the physical as well as the spiritual. But here in verse 1, it says, give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. We're going to see several mighty things. And we start with mighty men. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are, how powerful you are, how many people you have under your authority. You're not even close to touching the hem of the garment of God's power. Not even close. So give glory to God. You've received your power from him, whatever power that may be, whatever little it may be, whatever great it may be. God has decided how much power and influence and strength you'll have in this world. And so he challenges the mighty men of the earth to give glory to God. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. And so when you give glory to God, it's one thing to say, okay, glory to God. But it says, give glory, the, the level of glory due to God. Think about that for a minute. What a great challenge. Look at all that God has done in our creation. He spoke the universe into existence. On each day, he spoke every aspect of creation into existence. Look at us. Look at what he's done for us. Look at how he's sent Jesus for us to die on the cross for our sins. He loved us before we even knew who he was. Amen. The salvation that he brings are we worthy? Are we walking worthy of his calling? When we see that word due, giving him his due, what is God due? Well, God's due everything we have. He's due everything we can possibly give. You couldn't possibly give enough based on what God is due. He created us, loved us, gave us the breath of life, gave us his son on the cross for our sins. How could we give him his due? What does that mean? Could we give too much? We could give everything we have and it wouldn't be enough. Amen. And actually, we see that a little bit in Luke 17. Keep a hand here. I think this is my one cross reference tonight in our short message. Let's go to Luke together. Psalm 
17. We just had the story of Lazarus at the end of chapter 16. And then we get into 17, and Jesus said unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. He knew his destiny. He knew he needed to die on the cross for our sins, right? He knew that that was the plan. But then he also said, Woe unto him who is complicit, <laughs> right? And so it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. He's referring to all those who believe in him kind of like children. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Communication and forgiveness. A lot of times we like to ignore things until they go away. They might not go away. They might just get worse until we deal with them. And so it says, if you've got a problem with someone, they've, they've committed a trespass against you, you can tell him. You can even rebuke him. But then if you repent, forgive him. Quick to communicate, quick to forgive. And if you trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, Repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith, <laughs> notice this, in the area of forgiving others. That sounds like too much. I'm, I'm going to be mad for a bit, Lord. If someone, if someone treats me that bad, seven times a, a day, I might forgive him once, maybe twice. Lord, I'm going to need more faith for this. Increase our faith. And it's the context of this that Jesus gives this next parable. The Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to meat. And will he not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink? Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. That's his job. That's his job. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Now, when I see this parable, it's about perspective and service. I mean, we're the servant. If the Lord tells us to do something, it's not, oh, well, maybe when I get around to it. It's not, well, Lord, me first. It's like, no, I'm the Lord. You're the servant. It's the job of the servant to serve and do what he's told. And when you've done everything you're told to do, you still want to have the perspective of my Lord is due much more than this. I thought this was a good tie-in with give the Lord is due. A progress, But I always thought it was kind of funny where you find it located. It's really located right after this. We have trespasses, forgiveness, the apostles saying, increase our faith. And I don't know, the Lord just felt that it was saying, oh, well, if you really had faith, you know, all things are possible for him that has faith. He gives the quick little example of the tree. But then he talks about the master and the servant. We understand, we understand this in these cultures. It's harder in the West to understand this because in the West, everyone thinks that they're in charge of everything. And everyone thinks that they have a right to say whatever they want when they want and do whatever they want when they want. And that's a Western culture thing. That is not an old Eastern culture mindset. Master servant. That's the way the world worked when this was written. And you understand authority when someone's over you. And we can understand that to a degree. Uh, having employers. And the boss says, do this. And we say, no, I don't think so. Okay, you're fired, right? That's how it works. How about in the military? You look at your admiral. 
Say, I don't think we should do this, Admiral. Uh, yeah, okay, do it. But you don't talk back. Mm -mm. You do it. You say, sir, yes, sir. And there's this understanding of authority and due and rank and position. And when the Lord tells you, be forgiving, you don't kick it off as, well, I just don't have enough faith to do that. No, you, you seek, you seek the, the will of God. You seek obedience with the Lord. And under, I understand we can't do it without his strength. But when he says do this, we want to do it to the very best of our ability. Understanding that he is do this. God is worthy of this. He's able. He's our Lord and our creator. He can say whatever we want. And, but his commandments aren't grievous. They aren't grievous. We don't get to hold back on God. We give him everything he's due. And still we recognize we're not really worthy to eat of the crumbs of his table. So we're back in Psalm 29. Give the Lord the glory due unto his name. That's a lifelong challenge. That's a life verse right there. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now I know I harp on this a lot. And I think the modern church needs to hear it a lot because the modern church has worship all messed up. Worship isn't an emotion. You can worship with emotion. But feeling something doesn't mean you're worshiping God. You need to be obeying God and you need to be pursuing him in the beauty of holiness. I see the beauty of holiness connected to worship. You know what I don't see in a lot of mega churches? Holiness. I see a lot of the leadership constantly getting caught in sin. I see a lot of people in those churches constantly getting caught in the world and in sin. That's what I see with my eyes. We know people. We have friends in churches like this. We have family members and so forth. That are, and we hear stories. And we know exactly what's going on in a lot of these churches. Why? Because they've changed worship into something else. The beauty of holiness. The pursuit of holiness. What a great thing. You couldn't pursue holiness without Jesus Christ. But now you can. Now you've had all your sins forgiven. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You have the word of God, a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. You can pursue holiness. And that is worship. Verse 3, now we get into the voice of the Lord. There are seven descriptions of the voice of the Lord. They all deal with strength, authority, presence, dominion. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Man, if you're ever on top of your ship, Ryan, I want you to remember Psalm 29, 3. All this stuff about the Lord in the waters. It's good for Navy men. I like it. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Storm at sea, doesn't matter. The Lord's there. He's in it. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Now, God exalts the power of his word all throughout the Bible. I was exalted thy, thou hast exalted thy word above all thy name. Amazing. Because that's how we get to know God. If it weren't for the word of the Lord, we could make up anything we wanted to. But no, we, we rest our faith and our understanding and our knowledge on the revealed word of God. We spake briefly Sunday morning about the voice of the Lord and the power of his word. But we see here the waters. The waters are an interesting use in your Bible. They are separators of domain. Even before God had fully created the earth, he talked about in Genesis 1 about separating the waters. And of course, we know on our earth, we have land masses, continents, separated by great bodies of water. They're dividers of domain, and God is over them all. He's over all the earth. He's over all of creation. Thunderous, thundering, present active, an active storm. When we see verse 4, I mean, it's easy to say God is powerful. We know that. He's all-powerful. All-powerful. There isn't something you could conceive of that God couldn't take care of. 
all-powerful. The word majesty, is that a word you ever hear connected with anything else? I bet you don't hear the word majesty in English very often when you're about doing your day. Because it really can only be connected to God. Majesty, that word is actually from Latin, magir, uh, major, great, greater than. So majesty is something that has inherent greatness greater than other things. Greatness of appearance, dignity, grandeur, aspect, manner, the quality of state or of a person or a thing which inspires awe or reverence in the beholder. In other words, when our, with our spirit, we behold God. In our faith, we behold God. It should bring upon us awe and reverence and majesty. And we get a piece of that sometimes when we look at his creation. You get out into a really faraway place from all the city lights on a clear night, and you look at the stars. We get a little bit of that in Lymington. You don't get, you can't touch what we could get in Mongolia. When we were in Mongolia and we got outside of the one city they had, <laughs> you felt like the heavens were on fire and you could reach up and pluck stars out of the sky. Psalm 93 says, Jehovah reigneth. And he is clothed in majesty. Verse 5, the voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. Those were the biggest, strongest trees they knew of. And said, yep, God can snap those like twigs. Verse 6, he maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young, a young unicorn. Now in the Bible, a unicorn is not a flying horse with a ponytail. Reham from Hebrew is a beast with a horn. It's believed to be uh, in ancient Asian times, large wild cattle. An auroch perhaps was a wild cattle that stood over six feet tall, ancestors of our domestic cattle, bigger, stronger, wilder. They became extinct in the 1600s, something like that. The biggest animal they'd ever seen. So the mightiest men they knew, the biggest trees they'd ever heard of, the biggest animal they ever knew. They're throwing in all the biggest things they've got and saying, God, the voice is over them all. The voice of the Lord, verse 7, divideth the flames of fire. Now, by divide, we're kind of thinking of the idea of separate. Separate. An active idea, as in you divide, like the, pe the people of God were divided and scattered. Right? They, were, they were spread out throughout the earth. And so this idea here is that God can use fire. God knows about the forest fire. I mean, we've seen in California some pretty big forest fires. God's in charge of it all. Verse 8. Shaketh the wilderness. Shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. He knows of every earthquake. There was a great earthquake at the time of the crucifixion. The Lord also sent another earthquake to break the prison doors that bound Paul. And Paul could have ran away. Instead, he stayed there so he could witness to his jailer. God is over everything that we see in creation. Verse 9, we have the birth cycles of life with animals and forests. And here's another interesting coupling. Look at this in verse 9. Make it the hinds to calf, life and life cycle. Discovereth the forests. When you get out and you see massive forests, you think of the life of the earth. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. Because believers are God's lifeblood on earth. As we give our voice in praise to his majesty as a witness to the whole earth. And spiritual life leads you to worship. Verse 10. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Definite article, the flood. We're talking about the flood of Noah. Yea, the Lord sitteth 
king forever. This gives me imagery of God seated like on a throne of the flood. Like the idea here is God reigning over judgment righteously. No worldwide event could master God. He was the master of it. Sitteth on the flood speaks of power and authority. And there's an old Christian writer named Vangerman who wrote, even as in the days of the flood, when God destroyed creation with his power, but saved his own, so it is at any time that God's glory is expressed in the severity of judgment. God can wipe out the whole earth and save eight people. God can do that. And he's right to do that. He is a king forever, eternal. The idea of eternality in the Psalms. And finally, let's close with the blessing. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So what is his pronouncement? This great, thundering, powerful, awe-inspiring God. This king, how will he reign forever? Judgment on sin. Peace for his children. That sounds pretty good. Scary if you're in sin. But wonderful if you're his children. Strength for today. Hope for tomorrow. The power of God can come as a destructive storm upon creation. It could come upon the souls of rebels. But God's people can be confident because of his so many promises like this. That his ultimate desire is to bless his people with peace. And the strength of God comes to them, comes to them, his people, as a comfort, not a storm. To the enemy, it's a storm. For a minute while we're in it, we might feel afraid. But when we worship in awe the God of majesty, we know that he's with us in the storm. And so we can get comfort instead of fear. And as powerful as God is to overthrow the entire earth with the flood, he is just as powerful to heal and comfort our hearts and solve any problem that we have with him today. And that's what I get from Psalm 29.